Подача Остин! Все-таки Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. My name is Matt Markson. I'm the host of the show. If this is your first time, I'd like to welcome you to the show. If you've been a long-time listener, welcome back. Thank you for subscribing and coming back. I hope that you enjoy the show. Now, this week, coming off of another disappointing weekend, uh, another disappointing home loss for the Saints against a team that we would expect to beat, that we as, as fans, uh, as a club, would expect to take all three points from. And yet again, we are left disappointed both by the performance on the field and the points that we took away from the match. And uh, this is starting to become somewhat of a theme. We dominate possession. Uh, we don't really have any shots on target. We don't have any really clear-cut chances. We don't challenge the goalkeeper. They nick a goal. They take all three points. And, and we're left asking questions. And I think this is the first time that I've ever really felt very concerned about what's going on. And I'm not, I don't want to jump to conclusions about uh, relegation battles or things like that. Well, I'm, I'm sure if, if it is that time, that, that will make itself even more apparent and I will eventually get there. And I know some people already are there. Some people already are asking those questions. And I think that's, that's fine. I'm just not quite ready to do that. Just, and maybe it's my own, um, maybe it's just me looking at things uh, in, in the wrong way, maybe, but uh, we'll, we'll see. So Anyway, not not the greatest week to talk about the club. Um, maybe a good time for us to go on an international break and kind of clear our heads and take a break, it's, take a step back from it. But it's getting harder and harder to to kind of look at this in a new and interesting way when it's the same problems each and every week. But to help me do that is my guest this week, Jake Hughes, who is the editor at St. Mary's Musings, and we'll talk about his writing. Uh, he also writes about MMA. Uh, he's really in the metal, so we'll talk about uh, all three of those things. And I left more of that stuff in the show this week than in past weeks, simply because uh, I felt like something a little bit different was needed based on the fact that we were talking about the same issues that we've been talking about uh, for the last few weeks in terms of performances Saints have been putting in. So um, definitely heading into this international break uh, disappointed, uh, but hoping that over the course of the international break and, and coming out of it and going away to a tough LFC match that we can maybe uh, turn things around. So I'm still, uh, there, there's that optimism always there uh, for me. Even when I try not to let it out, um, it is still there. So uh, we won't spend too much time here because uh, my chat with Jake is quite lengthy. But before we get to, to that, I would like to point you in the direction of the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. For match day edits, polls, competitions, and more, be sure to check out the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. Matt, who runs the page, was a guest on the show just last week and also way back at the beginning. Uh, he's done the logo for the show. He's been a huge help. So I encourage you to head over to the We Are Southampton page and take part in everything that he has going on over there. The links to that are in the show notes. And with that being said, I think let's go ahead and get to the interview with Jay Hughes. Uh, you can get him on Twitter at JJ Hughes underscore, and you can find St. Mary's Musings at St. Mary's Musings. So be sure to head over there and check those out. And now that you know how to get a hold of him on social media, let's go ahead and get into the interview. So once again, here is Jake Hughes, editor of St. Mary's Musings, and we talked on Sunday after the disappointing match uh, on Saturday at St. Mary's. We'd like to welcome to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all the SOC fans, Jake Hughes. You can find him on Twitter at JJ Hughes, and he edits St. Mary's Musings, and you can find them on Twitter at St. Mary's Musings and links to all those are in the show notes. But Jake, uh, you know, we've been talking now for uh, quite a while uh, off off air, but uh, it's been good to kind of get to know you a little bit and and good to finally talk to you on the show. And thanks for coming on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. It's been uh, over an hour at the very least. Um, but yeah, it's been great. Uh, I've I've listened to your last few episodes. I did admit to you earlier, I'm, I'm quite uh, stingy with my podcasts, uh, thanks to some time constraints, but I've become a big fan of delivery podcasts, so I will be uh, a regular listener from now on. And uh, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be on. Thanks, I pre- appreciate that very much. Um, and then, like I said, I don't want to take up too much of your time, uh, but but we're here to talk about Southampton and about about St. Mary's Musings and and kind of all things in between. Um, generally, when I start the show, especially if it's first time guests, I like to get to know you a little bit in terms of uh, you know just how you became uh, a Southampton fan. So if we could start there, that'd be great. Yeah, um, so I I had uh, zero choice and zero say in the matter. 
my dad's a, a season ticket holder since the 70s. Um, I mean, I was born in, in 91, uh, not to make anyone feel old. But um, so, yeah, I've, I've been a Saints fan uh, since birth. Obviously, uh, <laughs> I think that obviously you don't really have a whole lot of uh, awareness of football when you're still in the post-embryonic stage. Um, I believe my, the first game I ever went to was a pre-season friendly uh, Southampton against Reading. It was at the Dell. I think it's in not. I think it's in '96, and I remember Klaus Lundekbahn and Limboy Primus. Uh, they got got sent off, and I think Saints won three 0 But um, my memory is a bit hazy. But uh, yeah, I've been a Saints fan uh, as long as I can remember. And my dad uh, used to threaten to put me in the shed if I didn't support Southampton. So my hand was forced. Yeah, yeah, especially I mean in California if you were in the shed, the weather is generally pretty nice, but I don't know. I don't know what it's like uh in the Hampshire yeah. area if that'd be if that'd be acceptable for most parts of the year, but um <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd have to wrap up warm in the winter months put it that way. Yeah, no no thanks. No thanks. Um <laughs> and now y- y- your dad was a season ticket holder for all those years. Are are you now a season ticket holder? I am. Yep. Yeah. I'm in uh block 42 in the northern. Okay. Uh if anyone wants to find me, I'm in row Double D, which is a, a memorable row for other reasons. Um, <laughs> and uh, seat number 1081, but I never actually stand in there because there seems to be like 100 people in my row for whatever reason. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I go with my dad um, and all his, his mates he's been going with since he was a kid. Um, so it is, yeah, it's a good time, even if uh, Southampton are poor. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you have a bunch of other interests in, in, on top of that. You're a big kind of MMA guy. And so you write for Vice Sports and Fightland. Uh, but I guess, you know, there's there's one level of interest that's, you know, you're, you kind of watch and, and consume all of the stuff that's out there. Uh, and there's a whole nother level that that goes with, I think, producing stuff. Um, so how did you kind of make that jump from watching MMA or g- being in the MMA to, to, to writing about it? Um, so I, I became an MMA fan it's another, it's another odd story to, uh, on top of many other odd stories, including being threatened to live in a shed. Um, so my very first day of college, uh, I had a rib injury. I somehow damaged the, my rib cartilage and my intercostal muscles. So I, I was, I was bed bound for three weeks and, uh, I had like a, a fleeting interest in MMA, but, um, I just basically spent that whole time, uh, watching. Uh, a lot of UFC and um, I've got quite an obsessive personality so if I get into anything I do a whole lot of research and I try to be as well informed as possible so I was a big fan and then after college I went to university to study uh, sport journalism at the University of Brighton passed with a 2-1 degree and uh, everyone uh, it was like a 70 strong course so and pretty much everyone there wanted to write about football and um you know, I, I wanted to find that niche and there's right. not a whole lot of, uh, there aren't many um, British MMA writers out there. Um, so I kind of picked that as a as a niche for me to try and uh, be an authority on. And uh, from there, uh, I got a writing gig at Fightland, which is a part of Vice um, and Vice Sports. And I, I was a first European writer, so I've covered a few events for them and uh wrote for them from early 2013 um up until this summer unfortunately uh vice sports have changed content directions they're looking more at um video content rather than written content okay uh so they laid off all their staff um <laughs> without any sort of prior warning so that oh, was no. quite a big shock yeah it's just the way it goes but i've got a few irons in the fire so um we'll see where they go Without wanting to say anything more. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I kind of like whenever I have a guest on, I kind of stock Twitter timelines and, and things like that. So you've had, I think you've had some decent, like some decent sized interviews, like through that channel in the MMA world. Is that, is that correct? You've had you actually interviewed fighters and things like that? Yeah, yeah. So my, my, the first, the very first um, UFC event I covered in person was in Stockholm, uh, Sweden. It was, uh, I've got the fight poster framed next to me. Just, it's, yeah, UFC Stockholm 2013 at the Ericsson Globe Arena. And it was, uh, Conor McGregor's UFC debut. Mm-hmm. Um, and being from the UK, uh, McGregor was already a big name. 
came on the UK scene. So ahead of that, I, I kind of got the, uh, I hate saying this word, but I got the scoop, I guess you could say, on uh, McGregor and uh, his coach, John Kavanagh, who's since become a best-selling author. And yeah, and got uh, one of the very first um, interviews for him for a North American online publication. And yeah, I went to the event. At the event and uh, Connor obviously won his debut in impressive fashion and he's become an absolute superstar in the space of four years uh, yeah. since then so it's been a crazy ride and uh, I've also interviewed people like uh, UFC Hall of Famer Dan Seven who was also once in the WWE or WWF as it was then uh-huh. uh, had a two-hour conversation with him and he was essentially uh, kind of he was very funny but kind of came across as a bitter old man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I loved him for that. It was a very unique experience. But I, I've interviewed a lot of interesting characters and written about all sorts of crazy things from, you know, the general general MMA news and, you know, opinion pieces on stories that come out through there. And MMA can be a crazy world in itself, um, a crazy echo chamber. But I've also written things about, you know, Russians teaching... Uh, their people how to defend themselves with selfie sticks before they go abroad and you know <laughs> w- weird stuff like that so uh it's awesome um yeah i mean anything i find interesting i'm i'm willing to write about so it's it's been a great experience and as i said um I'm currently in an interviewing process with um quite a well-known MMA publication so hopefully i can sort of uh, get back on that full time yeah absolutely um and, and just to kind of go what, one one more thing on the on the MMA thing is like Dan Seven is to you have to be a bitter old man to have fought in early <laughs> UFC you know like there, there yeah. you can only be so much of a of a nice guy to to do that and I remember my my grandfather who was the world's biggest WWF fan and really thought it was oh, real wow. um, he would <laughs> he would sit in his chair and he he was this t- he was four foot eleven and a half. He would uh, sit there and, and and yell at the TV and stutter and all this stuff. And it was great, and we would always come over. And I remember early UFC. My uncle goes, "Hey, there's this new thing, and you know you have you already have the illegal cable box from Canada. We could watch it." And so my my grandpa goes, "Yeah, sure. Everybody come over and and we'll, we'll watch." And uh, he's a he's you know thinking WWF is real. So how bad can it be? And it was like it was uh, one of the UFC <laughs> events where that guy broke. It was like the little tiny white guy versus the big giant black guy, and he the guy broke his arm or his wrist, like hammer fisting this guy in the side of the head. And my grandfather, I just remember like watching, I remember curling up on the couch, my grandfather watching with his jaw on the floor and like my uncle eventually just turning it off and going like, okay, like, I guess, I guess we're not going to watch this anymore. <laughs> uh, but, but even now I have, I have trouble. Uh, I can't, I can't sit and watch. I, I, I wind up just turning away like for most of the fight, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it is interesting and it's, uh, that's pretty crazy. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting world. Um, yeah, I, I I totally understand why it wouldn't be um, everyone's cup of tea, put it that way. I mean, um, when you would have watched your first UFC event, we're talking the very early days, and uh, to say there were very few rules um, would be an understatement. Yeah. So um, I could see a lot of people got bloodlust from that and totally adored it, but. Um, Luckily, the sport's grown up since then, and uh, <laughs> there are rules now, which is um, a good base to start from, I'd say. Every now and then, I like to sort of go back and delve into the UFC archives in particular and um, see some of the old fights and even some of the old sort of um, fight promotions, the, the video segments before, and it's comically bad. Oh, yeah. Um, it's it's great, yet yeah. it's hard to watch. Um, the, the, yeah, I... I could list off a string of fights which I'd recommend people to watch just to see the pure insanity of the early days of um, what's now known as mixed martial arts. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's not not suitable for everyone, I'd say. No, no. I mean, and that's part of the reason that the the Gracie family kind of got out of it was like, you're going to put this rules on. Mm-hmm. It's not a street fight anymore, and we're we're done. Yeah. So we'll just walk away. It, it's insane. Yeah. Um, yeah and, the, and the Gracie family, for anyone listening, they're they're the the originators essentially of uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and a member of the Gracie family actually was part of the team that formed UFC uh, essentially as a marketing tool to promote Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as this unstoppable martial art. Because at the time it was boxers facing karate guys, it was uh, wrestlers facing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu um, artists. So, uh, so that was like its original form. And obviously it's evolved since then. Um, 
so yeah, it's uh, it's changed a hell of a lot since then. And Dan Seven, uh, just to go back with him, he was a former amateur wrestler who uh, won all sorts of state titles in the US. I think he was even in uh, a couple of Olympics, uh, consecutive Olympics in some capacity. Went on to professional wrestling with uh, WWF and regional shows and also fought in the UFC, winning belts there. And he is one of three fighters, I believe, to have over 100 wins in MMA. Um, and you think about how much that sport takes a toll on you, it's quite incredible. And uh, he's still still talking about fighting now, and he's well into his 50s. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea what kind of guy we're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he's a unique character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll, we'll cover more of that on the other podcast, which is like <laughs> MMA Today. Um, but, <laughs> but um, you know, so you also have St. Mary's Musings, which is takes up a big kind of part of your uh, of your time, and and that's dedicated, of course, to to the Southampton Football Club, and it's run through um, SB Nation, which is is here based in the states, I, I believe. I'm safe in saying that. Yeah. Um, and so if people were to go to St. Mary's Musings or, or kind of what, what could they expect if they were to visit either the Twitter feed or, or the website? Um, so the site's always been positioned as a platform for fan opinions, how, however wrong I, I think they are. Um, a, a perfect example was, and I'm not sure if um, you remember this, Matt, but uh, two seasons ago as, as Leicester were sort of um, getting closer to the title, I allowed one of the uh, the writers to post something online about how he wanted Leicester to actually beat Southampton just to stop Tottenham from and Pochettino from getting the getting the uh, the Premier League championship. <laughs> um, and oh my God, the uh, the response was interesting. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with everything people say, but I like actually hearing opinions, and that's what the the website's always been about. Um, if you have an opinion, great. I, I want to be a platform to share it. And uh, it's largely been a platform to share my opinions. And luckily, I haven't rocked the boat too much. But um, just posting about the, the Leicester, <laughs> that Leicester article was uh, probably the, the most flack we've ever got. And it was uh, sizable. But uh, yeah, that's how I always wanted to position the site. Just a sort of free thinking sort of uh, forum for fans to share opinions and, um, you know, without anyone there to tell you your opinions wrong. It's, uh, yeah, it's just a place for free ideas, all Saints related. Yeah. All right. All right. And if people are looking to get involved, if they are interested in possibly writing or something else like that, how would they go about doing that? Um, hit us up. I, I think um, on Twitter, our, our DMs are open so you can slide into them anytime. The, <sighs> I am absolutely terrible at replying, so I, I will endeavour to get back to you as soon as possible. But we're we're always looking for contributors, so um, the more the merrier. Especially if you've got plenty to say, you're the kind of uh, guy or girl we want. Um, so yeah, just uh, hit us up on Twitter. Okay, easy enough. And and the links to all those once again are in the show notes, uh, both your Twitter. Uh, St. Mary's Musings, uh, all that stuff. So it, it's there. And and I do have to say that I, I really enjoy, I know, I know Alan does a lot of your uh, match day kind of Twitter stuff and he, yeah. he makes me laugh more often than not. And sometimes it's like <laughs> having talked to him in the past, it's like, I can't like, it's, it's like, I try to imagine what voice he's using. Like, is he, is he being sarcastic? Is he being serious? Uh, mm. what, what, where, where's he at right now? What's, how's he feeling? But it's, it's, it's always good. I enjoy that. So anybody who's looking for, for a good laugh on match day, which I think we all need at this point. Um, yeah, you can get it, yeah, you can I'll get it for, so. through Alan and, and the St. Mary's music Twitter handle. So, um, I guess this is probably the last time we laugh for a while, uh, talking about, about saints, but, um, going into yesterday's match, uh, going into, to face Burnley at home. Um, I think we've said this over and over that it's kind of one of those matches where we we would expect to win. I think looking at Burnley, who Burnley is, uh, that's a team that we would expect to beat. But once again, we were we were disappointed. I think, and uh, I guess I guess now is the time we kind of go through and talk about that. Um, first of all, did you? I know your season ticket older, but we were talking earlier you're a little bit sick, so you you didn't go, but you were able to watch the match uh, on a stream. But I, I guess kind of what did you make of, of the lineup and the the uh, kind of how we set up to to take on a, a Burnley squad that we knew was going to sit deep and, and soak up pressure? Um, I mean, with a kind of team like Burnley, uh, you know how they're going to play and their, their away form has picked up this season. I think they've already um, earned more points away from home 
just 11 games in than they did all season um, last year. So I wasn't expecting a Saints win necessarily, especially at this stage. It's kind of wrong to expect us to win any any game. Yeah. Um, but I was hoping, you know, times like these, just hope for a good performance. And um, I felt we were hampered with team selection from, from the get-go, really. Uh, so last week against Brighton, I found it very odd that uh, Yoshida was... I, I have no issue of us playing uh, Wesley Hurt or Hoot. I don't know how to pronounce his name yet. Uh, I have no, I'll just call him uh, Big Wes. Um, <laughs> I have no issue with uh, Big Wes playing. Uh, I think he's looked um, really impressive since joining. But I, I didn't quite understand what Yoshida had done to warrant being dropped. And argu- I'd say arguably he'd been performing better than Van Dyke. And both Van Dyke and Big Wes are left footed defenders, and it makes sense for. You know, uh, Wesley to replace Van Dyke rather than Yoshida. But, um, and then this week, obviously Yoshida's come back in for Wesley. And, uh, you know, the, the goal we conceded was, uh, Sam Vokes, who's, you know, six foot two plus on Yoshida with a running start, um, and scores a great header. A part of me thinks that if, uh, if, uh, Wesley was in Yoshida's place, that header wouldn't have come off. Um, that might be just wishful thinking, and you know, benefit of hindsight is always twenty twenty. But uh, I think there's there's other issues with the the lineup. I mean, with a team like Burnley, who are bound to sit back, no matter how good their away form is, a lot of the time they try to sit back, soak up pressure, and try and nick a goal. And that's exactly what they did yesterday. And to sort of break down a team like that, we can't be simply just pumping in aimless crosses, which is seems to be our only mode of attack at the minute um, against towering centre halves. You know, Gabbiadini's left totally isolated up top in his own. You, you have to be creative, and unfortunately for us, our, our attacking midfield options in Redmond, Tadic, and guys who started, um, oh, and Buffel, it uh-huh. just didn't work at all. And um, Redmond's been poor this season, and he, you know, after a while, he, he was benched. But I believe Tadic. You know, has started at least like you know all bar one game this season. I don't, I've I've never been the biggest fan of uh, Dusan Tadic, but it's safe to say he's having his worst form in a Saints shirt this season. Um, I don't know what he has to do to warrant getting dropped because um he's been in my opinion totally ineffectual so far. And um you know we had all once again we had all of the ball yesterday against Burnley. Try nothing different with our lineup bar a centre-half change and the inclusion of Redmond once again in the squad. The formation stays the same and, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, our attack stayed the same in the sense that we didn't really offer anything convincing at all. Um, right. So, yeah, very disappointing. Yeah, and, you know, when I looked at the lineup yesterday and I saw that we had both Buffal and Tadic in the lineup, you kind of think like those are the two creative players that we, we do have. And maybe they're going to be able to kind of, if, if anybody is going to be able to break down Burnley, those two will be the two to kind of find the final pass and do that. Um, and I think they switched out and in between playing centrally and, and playing on the wing and um, a couple of times a or, or winger switched sides. And so I think, I thought that was good. But like you said, we we kind of were relegated to just, pumping crosses in and that's exactly what Burnley wants you to do they're they're confident that they can defend those it, we didn't try enough of the the quick one touch passing uh to open up holes and be able to 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 get a pullback and have a guy standing at the penalty area with a with a chance to have a shot uh, we didn't do that enough and when we did do it it looked like it was great and it, we actually had chances we just you know couldn't quite do it you got to do it over and over and over and we just didn't do it enough um yeah uh like you said the the center back situation is going to be difficult because uh in, in my opinion you know van dyke is probably going to leave this summer which means you're going to have yoshida and 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 hoot or hoyt or whatever it is uh <laughs> there and so both of them probably need to play and I, i've seen some people argue that van dyke should just be taken out of the lineup completely you know let and let's develop those two uh let's develop that partnership together but you know i don't know van dyke is probably our best player he probably needs to, to be in the lineup if if you got him you, you use him you don't pay him the wages and, and something yeah. like that to to not have him in but but then like you said you know Tanich has been terrible he's he's been he was bad last year and he's even worse this year um Mm-mm. but if you look at kind of uh, I'm, I'm looking at the team sheet from yesterday now you know Tadich, davis and, and bertrand are the three 
and I guess Yoshida too, but Yoshida didn't start for so many of those years. Um, they're, they're really the veterans on the team. You know, they've been there approaching the longest and Forrester, I guess too. But, um, you look at those guys around him, Buffal, Gabby Dini, Redmond, they're all relatively new. Cedric's relatively new. So, so is Van Dyke. So it's, you know, may, maybe he's there just to provide that stability, but he really doesn't do that either. He's not, he's not stable. He's not consistent. Uh, he's the, the exact opposite of Steven Davis, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, I don't know. It's just, um, it's totally uninspiring at the minute, and um, I'm I'm not a dramatic Saints fan at all. I was uh, one of the one of the few on on Twitter at, at the very least that felt um, Claude Puel got kind of a, a raw deal last season, and uh, that nothing's changed. I mean, the w- the way we're playing at the minute, and as you mentioned, we have a number of two three season veterans at the very least now at the Saints, and um, the team. I, and I felt this was the the issue under Puel last season was uh, I just don't think the team's good enough. I mean, we lost last summer. We lost uh, both Mane and Pella. Mm-hmm. They weren't replaced. Gabbiadini came in uh, to make up the striking numbers um, in January. But then, you know, if, since the League One days, we've had a big target man up front who can hold up the ball, and that's allowed our wingers to flourish. Um, well, you know, well we have that kind of figure in our team with Ricky Lambert and then Graziano Pella. Mm-hmm. And now we have Gabbiadini who at the very tallest is about six one, six two, um, is a, a former a winger at, at Napoli and mm-hmm. we seem totally, totally afraid to even feature him out wide and allow someone like Charlie Austin who I believe scored most of our goals last season, but I think Redmond came on strong as well. Uh, you know, Austin's not getting a look in at all. Whereas Gabbiadini, he, I think he's rarely played as an out-and-out striker throughout his career. Why don't we ever feature him at wide? And um, I don't think our squad's, I don't think our squad's good enough. But I think another problem compounding that is the fact that Pellegrino seems unwilling to at least try different things, whether it's with personnel or tactical setup and and this season we, we can't even blame the fact that we sold our best players bar losing Jay Rodriguez who you know started a fair few games our season uh, but wasn't our, our number one pick as a striker and we lost Jordi Classy on loan and Kuko Martina to Everton on a free you know we haven't lost that major player this season and it, it seems like we just haven't strengthened the squad how we should have I think any Saints fan worth their salt could see that we needed more attacking options mm-hmm. um, and, an, and an improvement in attacking options. And instead, we bought uh, a centre-half in, in Wesley and we, we brought in Mario Lamina, who looks a great player. But, you know, it's not really helping the issues we have going forward, which was by far and away our biggest issue last season. So I, I do feel resigned to... Maybe a relegation battle is is um, a bit extreme, but I would happily take 17th as our final position in the league just to ensure we stay up at this stage because our early season running was very much uh, one of the the easier ones. You know, we've drawn all three games against newly promoted teams. We've dropped points against Swansea, who are struggling. Yeah, and yeah, a, num- a number of games we should have at least got a decent result from and we haven't and we have a, a horrible Christmas run coming up and come January if we're if we're not around the relegation zone then I'd be very very surprised right right yeah it's it, it I don't know if I don't know if you've ever had a tattoo but like the first tattoo I ever got yeah. <laughs> um the guy you know does one line and he goes how'd that feel and I go you know you know didn't not not great not not what i expected you know <laughs> and and then he kind of just said well it only gets worse from here and then he kind of cackled and and went about his business and and that's kind of what we're looking at here is it it, it the, the schedule in terms of 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 what it looks like it, it only gets worse you know we we it, it doesn't let up until after the after the christmas period and it's going to be it's going to be difficult but you know there were people on twitter yesterday saying you know no matter what no matter how you feel about the manager or the players whatever we have to get behind him at the game time and and i'm i'm totally with that but i think each and every week, it, it gets harder and harder to do that. It gets harder and harder to sit there for 90 minutes and cheer something that you know from the outset probably isn't going to work. And, you know, I think we see a problem in any aspect of our lives and you you address it and you change something, you try something new. And it seems like we see a problem on the pitch 
you know, Pellegrino has to see the problem on the pitch and then we're not necessarily trying anything new to try to address that. Uh, and I think it's frustrating for, for fans, especially, especially season ticket holders who spend uh, their time and their money to, to, to go down there and, and, and support the club every week and want to see something that is uh, attractive and, and attacking. And it, like you said, just see a good performance and we're not, we're not even getting that out of it. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally right. And, and that's the issue. I, I, I think, you know, if we do go through the Christmas period and we don't pick up many points um, and we're going to be in the relegation zone or in or around it, I mean, the, the league the league table as of now is so close, I don't, I don't see that changing. I think anyone from 13th, 14th down is going to be, you know, at least within two games, a potential two games away from being sucked into a relegation dogfight. And, um, you know, if we do have the poor December, which I think most people expect us to have, um, and we are in or around the relegation zone, then it's all an uphill battle from there. And um, if you think the the atmosphere around the club is, fru- you know, frustrated or even toxic at this stage, it's going to be so much worse when, you know, the big teams come to town and give us a pasting which looks fairly inevitable at this stage. And um, I mean, that's a, a worrying thing. And, and you shouldn't really um, focus too much on the, you know, the ifs, uh, you know, if this happens come Jan- uh, come December, January, and, you know, no one truly knows what happens and we might somehow surprise a few people and pick up some good results. But, you know, all you can do is base your opinion on what you have seen so far and it's not looking promising at the minute. And um, as you say, Pellegrino is either unwilling or unable to sort of stem the tide and, and change things around. Uh, so I felt under uh, Claude Puel, Southampton looked a bit more pragmatic and the football wasn't particularly attractive, but we seemed to play with a purpose and defensively especially we were a lot more solid, whereas now I don't see any particularly redeeming features in this team. And, you know, it was all well and good last season attacking-wise. We were poor, but at least you knew we, we were capable of keep, keeping a clean sheet. Um, I don't even see that as an inevitability with Southampton like at home. Um, Burnley yesterday, you know, their their goal came off their first shot on target, but even though they were barely in our half, in in the back of your head, it's always like they could easily, you know, just lump the ball up, put in a cross, and we're in trouble, mm-hmm. um, goal or otherwise. And uh, unfortunately, that was the case. And it was even um, against Brighton last week. You know, Southampton fans especially, but as a football fan, you shouldn't feel entitled to get a result against a newly promoted team like Southampton not so long ago were in that position, whether it's from the League One to the Championship, where we didn't, you know, escape the top two um, the whole season in the Championship as we earned promotion to the Premier League. Um, it's, it's, I guess it's, um, you know, it's not always a given that you're going to pick up results uh, especially away from home at a newly promoted team. But on paper, that Brighton team, while while strong in the championship, Southampton should be looking to get a positive result. But if anything, I felt Southampton were the team that were there for the taking. We, especially in the second half, we were totally scared to attack Brighton. And if we weren't scared, we looked totally incapable of attacking Brighton and actually getting out of our own half. Um, I was at the Brighton game last week and uh, the away end was, is behind the goal we were shooting towards in the second half. And I could probably count on one hand how many times we actually approached their goal. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's very concerning. I'm not resigned to, you know, the ultimate doom of relegation just yet. But come January, if things don't pick up before then or somehow throughout this December period that we've got ahead of us, um, I do feel... We're in for very interesting times and not in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of similar to last year, you you start to see that the space between, you know, seventeenth, eighteenth and and you know, eighth or ninth is not very much. And then the top half of the table, you know, the top four are probably gonna pull away. The top six will be a, a, you know, a little bit closer, but that is is kind of what you would expect. So if you go through a run like we are set up to do, kind of where you have a, a difficult run of fixtures it doesn't take much for you to to drop down the table. I mean, we dropped from 10th to 13th uh, place yesterday. 
um, yeah. off the back of of one loss, and uh, where we actually had a chance to you know to jump up into to eighth or so. Um, but you know, it is it's disappointing, and I think it's it's not what anybody expected out of us. But you know, um, you you mentioned at least last year there was some sort of identity to the team in terms of how we played, and this year we're kind of struggling for that. Uh, because we don't really know what to expect other than, yeah, we just don't know really what to expect from, from the team when they go out there each and every week. But, you know, we didn't add a whole lot to, to the attacking end of our, of our lineup over the summer, like you mentioned. And so I think it was always going to be difficult to, to expect us to really go out and, and, and become that kind of side that we saw either under uh, Pochettino or Kuman, but both had very distinct kind of styles. And then, and then even Puel last year had at least his idea of, of, of what he wanted to do, but it, it seems like Pellegrino is really struggling to kind of decide what that is or figure out what it is. Um, and I do have a, a question. I don't really think we need to, to belabor yesterday's kind of match because I think we all kind of saw what it was. It was, it was slow. There were, there were not enough shots on target. There were, uh, you know, and then we concede from the one chance that we give up. Um, and I'm kind of tired of saying that, you know, we dominated possession uh, because that seems to be a given with us uh, recently, but we only had two shots on target yesterday for the entire match. And if you're going to have 60% possession and, and not be able to do that, that's just not, it's not good enough, you know? No, no <sighs> it's not good enough at all. Sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> that's a, kind of a loss, a loss for words, uh, getting yeah. frustrated over, over, over looking at it all again. Yeah. Um, and that, that reminds me of the, uh, if you ever want, like a, a true sort of indication of how your season's going to go. Just look at the first game against Swansea. I think we had, um, I'm coming up with these at the top of my head, so I could be wrong, but I feel like we had uh, around like 60% possession, around 30 shots, but only two on target. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is still in August. And if anyone's sort of um, watching that game and thinking, oh, this is much better than last season, then I, I don't know. I, I wish I was seeing what you're seeing. Like if I, if I was Les Reed, say, I'd be like, right, we still have plenty of attacking issues. Maybe we should go out and buy someone. And as I mentioned earlier, like I really feel that Claude Puel got sort of uh, the raw raw end essentially last season. I, I feel like he did a decent enough job um, with a group of players which aren't particularly exciting to watch and you know I think Claude came out last week um, upon taking the, the Leicester job and mentioned that um, he got he got sacked from Southampton due to uh, a, dis- a disagreement uh, with the board in terms of ideas of what course uh, they want the football club to take and you can read into that in so many ways you can either look into that and think the board are expecting too much from the current crop of players we have, or Claude Puel saying that we can only play this particular style of football with this team, um, and the board had different ideas, or maybe even Claude Puel said we need more investment in the squad. And I think there's an argument for all three of those points. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, he, he hasn't exactly said uh what happened in their meetings but the indication i get is the board didn't like his style of football and have went out and recruited mauricio pellegrino who came off a good season at alaves but they largely played very defensively purely because they're a newly promoted team and surprised a few teams uh in the liga to be fair but Mm -hmm. the, the football was not exciting and if the board sacked Claude Puel for the reason that the football wasn't entertaining enough, then Pellegrino is not not the man they should have appointed. And it, even now, it, it still irks me a little bit because the writing was on the wall clearly for Puel for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Yet it took at least a couple of weeks for the news to come out that he'd been sacked. And in that time, you had the likes of Marco Silva going to Watford, who rumour has it was interested in the Southampton role should it be free mm-hmm. and look at the job he's done at Watford and we've ended up with Pellegrino who was interviewing with uh, Crystal Palace I believe um, at the time Puel got sacked and you know was Pellegrino really the number one choice for for the Saints board um, 
And and also on a human level, I think it was wrong to string Claude Puel along. Like, how long does it take to... I remember Les Reed said something along the lines of the week following the season they were going to have a meeting regarding Claude Puel's future. Right. And then it took another couple of weeks for it to come out that he'd been sacked. And that might have been down to negotiating a severance package or something like that. But, you know, while Claude Puel was left in limbo, there's rumours that uh, San Etienne in France wanted it were interested in Claude Puel, but he was technically still Southampton manager, so couldn't even approach him. Um, so I feel like Puel's landed on his feet at Leicester, which was a fairly surprising appointment. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I was thinking, look, you're clearly going to get rid of this guy. Why don't you just do it now and be proactive in attracting a manager which you feel um, has the style to suit the club identity you've been trying to build for years? And actually let Claude Puel, you know, explore the market for himself. I just, I just felt it's all been handled really poorly. And um, I think that reflects in our squad recruitment as well this summer. It, it was deemed a success that we didn't sell Van Dyke over the summer. But then even without the benefit of hindsight, I remember tweeting at the time, how can you call this transfer window um, a victory? when we still haven't bought any attacking options, which was clearly the issue we had last season. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm talking a lot, but it's, it's no, good no. to get it off your chest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is, if, if nothing else, this will be therapeutic at least, and hopefully. <laughs> yeah, very, very yeah. much so. I went on a, uh, oh wow, it was a six-tweet rant, I guess you could say, on, on Twitter yesterday. I did try and remain as controlled as possible. <laughs> but... <laughs> But but one of those points um, is the fact that uh, in the last 18 Premier League games, and, you know, I'm not absolving Puel of all criticism because, you know, our poor form essentially started at the end of last season. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the last 18 Premier, Premier League games, which factors in seven from lo- towards the end of last season, uh, Saints have earned just 16 points. Um, God, that's terrible. And that... If that's not relegation form, I don't know what is. And again, the the caliber of opponent we've faced so far this season suggests we are. We are. I'm just going to say, it, I, I believe we're in trouble. Yeah, it's it it is frustrating. And and to go back to one of the things you you brought up is, I think when we saw Puel go, it was you know. It could be a number of factors, uh, like you said, that, that that led to his departure. I think largely fans were unhappy with the style of football. It wasn't that eighth place in a cup final wasn't a good you know, finish on the season. Uh, and, and in fact, everybody that looks at that from the outside says, like, what are you doing? Why are you getting rid of him? Mm. And you're giving him the shaft. And I think a lot of people now are probably rooting for us to kind of, you know, uh, to fail a little bit. You know, yeah, maybe we did the wrong thing. But I don't I hope that's not true, but I think it, it might be. Um, yeah, yeah, but, there could be an element to that. Just like with Leicester when they sacked Ranieri. I yeah, think, I mean, for years now, Southampton's kind of been deemed as like a, a nice club, and they do things the right way. They have a, an academy which promotes English talent and mm-hmm. all this stuff. But uh, let's face it, like the the academy hasn't really produced any first team starters for quite a while now. Yeah. I mean, well, not since um, not since Ward Prowse in 2012. We haven't had any regular starters from our academy. Right. Um, and, you know, I guess maybe the allure's kind of gone. And and uh, if Puel does, I think especially if Puel does a good job at Leicester, which I think he will with the squad he has, sort of outside observers have every right to sort of think that, you know, you, you screwed up. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's something I wanted to kind of touch on is if you look at, you know, Kuman leaves, uh, there, there's tons of disagreement there over over transfer budgets and, and everything else and, and direction of the club and all this stuff. Then you get Puel in and he makes the decisions he makes about the club and the style of football that we're going to play. And he plays it and he plays it well. And I think he looks at last year and says that's a success. Um, eighth place cup final, you know, that didn't score as many goals as maybe we wanted to, but, but still uh, with the squad we have, this is the style we play. And then we get rid of him because that's not good enough. In comes Pellegrino and it's largely the same thing. And then Puel gets hired on at Leicester and granted it's still early for him, but you know, 
they didn't necessarily look boring. He 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 seems to have seen that squad and go, this is the style we're going to play with you. And it, it, you start to kind of wonder, um, and it's, it's part of the reason I put that that tweet out there yesterday, you know, it, the poll, is it is it the board? Is it is it the manager? Is it the players? Is it is it everything? Like where where is this starting to fall apart for us? Because for a long time, I've always kind of stood up for the board and, and said, and, and the players and everybody else and said, oh, it's just, it's kind of a run of bad luck. You know, if you keep putting balls in the box, if you keep doing this, you'll eventually kind of score. And, I, and I'm not sure I can, I'm not sure I can say that anymore. I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm comfortable kind of continuing down that path. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I mean, even under Kuman, his uh, second and final season at Saints, I remember, I think it was a period between November and maybe January or February. I think it, well, definitely January. Um, I remember going to Sheffield United away and losing 1-0 in uh, the League Cup uh, quarters final. And uh, that was absolutely awful. And that was part of the run. But I remember Kuman went through a, a good two, three-month spell where Saints weren't picking up any points at all. Mm-hmm. Um, we somehow managed to finish sixth and um, largely due to everyone around us being poor. Uh, I mean, we finished in front of Liverpool um, that season, so uh-huh. it says a lot about how, and Leicester won the league, so it does say how odd that season was. But you're right, uh, you know, slumps in form uh, are totally inevitable with any cup, mm-hmm. uh, no matter what size, and obviously you've got teams like Man City, and even they had dips in form last season um, after initially looking like all-conquering title contenders. Mm-hmm. But the issue I have with Southampton at the moment is there doesn't seem, I mean, and this is almost uh, amplified by the fact we've been facing largely lower lower half of the table competition so far. There doesn't seem to be any upside um, or even like a light at the end of the tunnel um, with our upcoming fixtures. You know, if we can't beat these teams early in the season, what, what, you know, how does that co- correlate with the second half of the season where we have to play, you know, Watford away? They beat us at home 2 0. Mm-hmm. You know, can we expect to take points away from there? And in terms of the underlying issues, I, I feel so, as you said before, you, you've supported the board plenty of times. And I think it's totally undeniable the likes of Les Reed have transformed our club in a very positive way. Um, and to overlook, you know, the job he has done at Southampton would be um, entirely wrong. Mm-hmm. But you know, he's not only a director of football. I think that's his official title, but he's also a member of the board. And I think that's inherently a bad thing because it kind of makes him untouchable and also doesn't really uh, promote any form of cul- culpability because. You know, how often do you see board members sacked by each other? Um, it's rare. Right. And um, I think the issues we've had is, obviously, he's been a major part of the decision to let go Claude Puel. Um, I can't say I was totally angry at that decision, but I do feel I'm maybe like 70-30 on thinking that he should have been given another season. But also, not only is he... You know, as I said, a director of football, but he's also a member of the board um, and has a large say on any signings we make. And if he couldn't see that we had clear issues within our squad, I think across the board, not just attacking wise, but um, you know, e- even with uh, formation, we seem absolutely hell bent on playing this four-two or four-three-two-one formation with two wingers, very dependent on these wingers when. Last season, Redmond was good in, uh, you know, monthly patches, but wasn't mm-hmm. consistent enough for me. Unlike, uh, well, even Mane in our formation would have patches of um, looking fairly average. Yeah. Um, and Ta- and Tadic didn't perform well at all last season. So I don't think there was any... I'd love to know what went on with their sort of um, transfer strategy meetings, if they even have one or what kind of players they were scouting, because I don't think any of the problems were addressed. Um, I think we, the only positive, I think I think Wesley looks a good addition mm-hmm. at the back, but I feel like we didn't really need to strengthen that area. We always knew we were going to keep Van Dyke, which 
kind of suggests to me maybe we didn't actually get the bid we were expecting in the summer. And uh, Lamina came in and he he looks good um, as like a dynamic part of a midfield which was quite laboured last season. But to be honest, I I don't think they were the key areas that needed strengthening. And I feel feel like a huge opportunity was missed this summer. Yeah. Um. And and we're feeling it now. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think you're right. Now, I mean, there's loads more we could talk about about the club uh, and about yesterday's match, but I'm not sure that I need, I'm not sure we need to. Do do you? Is there anything that you feel is necessary that you want to point out b- before we kind of move on? Not at all, really. Um. I guess the only thing is the fact that it's well known Sam Vokes was a Southampton fan, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd, I'd love to get his take on Saints as a, an opposition player and a fan. That would be really interesting. But um. Yeah, maybe, maybe he's he's the man that's uh, finally turned the tide entirely against uh, Pellegrino, even in the early stages of the season. Um, one thing I have done with St. Mary's Musings, and not everyone's liked it, after every game, I've done a, a Twitter poll called the uh, Pellegrino Approval Rating. And essentially, I, I created it in response to what I deem to be um, sort of a lot of fans were very quick to jump on Claude Puel's back last season. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I kind of, um, I did see the writing on the wall a little bit. So I've done this since the very first game against Swansea, and I've just tried to track fan opinion. And it's totally unscientific. I mean, it's on Twitter, so. Sure. Um, but it's just, and the, yeah, a lot of people had a bit of an issue. Was, oh, this isn't helpful, helping with morale. So like, no, Pellegrino is not looking at this Twitter poll, so don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> If he is, we have other yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I believe it's the um, lowest the polls ever been <sighs> after. And it is, uh, yeah, four percent approval rating. I think the previous lowest was nine percent. That it that is lower so, than uh, you know uh, the U.S. illustrious president Donald Trump. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's saying something. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's rough, man. And and as I said, it's totally unscientific, and it's more a bit of fun and sure an experiment based on the reaction to well, but. I don't think that's a good sign. No, that's that's definitely not a good sign. Definitely, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> but for the most part, we're gonna we're gonna forego uh, the listener questions th- this week, just because we've I think we've discussed most of the things we can in, in looking at kind of the club and the issues we have and and the kind of on field performance that it leads to. But you know, we're going into international break. When we come back, we got to go to Anfield. Uh, we have to go to Anfield, I should say, as a as a teacher. But uh, we have to go to Anfield, and and that's gonna be tough. You you know, Liverpool probably have some disdain for us based on our dealings over the summer. It'll be interesting to see if Van Dyke plays. It's all going to be kind of kind of what it is. And and hopefully, you know, maybe maybe we go out there and we just completely blow them away because their defense is, is atrocious, but but I don't see it happening. I hope so. <laughs> we um, can we can uh, all hope and pray. So. Yeah, yeah. Um but I do have I do have a, a couple questions for you. Uh, based on your your MMA kind of writing and and, and stuff. Uh, if you had to pick one Saints player you think would make the best MMA fighter. Uh, who do you think that would be and in, in, in why, maybe? Past or present? Uh, why don't we do one of both? One of each. Okay. Um, God, I've got on the spot. I think uh, from the past, I'll pick Michael Svensson. His nickname was Killer for a reason, so I think he'd he'd be uh, a good middleweight, I'd say, in okay. the UFC. Um, present, um, it's got to be Fraser Forster, surely. Six foot six. And he's not he's not a Peter Crouch build, put it that way. He's uh he's a big old unit, so I think he'd um he'd pack some power, I'd say. My my only not very w- quick off his feet though. Yeah, that was gonna be Might my be thing, is I think once <laughs> if we get you know, you get a wrestler in there, you get a you know, you get him in there and I think if he goes down, if he gets taken down, it's probably over. Um <laughs> But I, I was I was thinking like maybe Lamina just looks like he's just mean enough to get it done, you know? Yeah, yeah. He's got a good build for it as well. He's got very long limbs, which obviously helps with reach. So um, uh, that's a good shout. I went, perhaps I was more thinking about the old UFC days, um, <laughs> the freak show fights, just yeah, get Forster yeah. in there to yeah. throw some haymakers. Yeah. But um, <laughs> uh, I also, you, you mentioned, uh, or on your, on, your Twitter, on your Twitter feed, you, you like metal, right? Uh, in terms of music? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah. You have a favorite band? Oh, no, again, a tough one. Um, and also, my, my love for metal can also be directly accredited to my dad because that's all he listened to when I was a kid. Okay. Um, I'll talk about bands I'm listening to now. 
I'm listening to a lot of um, After the Burial. Okay. Um, I don't know if you would have heard of them. Uh-uh. Um, they're they're quite um, on the quite high on the heavy scale, I'd okay. say. So again, not everyone's cup of tea. Um, and then bands I kind of grew up listening to. Um, I'd always love uh, System of a Down, although I'm not sure if you can really class them as a, a metal band. And I, I grew up, um, I was still quite young, but I grew up when new metal was a thing. Uh-huh. And I like I liked most of those bands, bar like Limp Bizkit. Right, um, right. But yeah, at, at the moment I'm listening to Majority after the burial and uh, a bit of um, Lamb of God splashed in. But okay. again, I don't I don't expect you to know them. <laughs> no, no, I, I know Lamb of God for sure. Um, oh, cool. I'm, I'm kind of more stuck in like hardcore more than more than okay. metal. Um, mostly because when I went to college or university. I didn't have any money. And so what I did was I just took all my brother's music who and he's, he's five years younger than me. So he's, he's about your age. Um, and so he had all this hardcore music because he was skating all the time and stuff like that. And so I started listening to that on my, my first ever iPod, my iPod nano. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I just remember listening to, to those bands. And so those bands, those songs are still like, we, we will put it on cause he, he lives here with me and, and my wife and kids and, and him and his daughter are here. So uh, every once in a while, you know, we'll just, I'll just put a speaker outside his door and, and play one of those songs. And he just kind of, we both do it and we both know the, the stuff and it's kind of cool. But if you were to take a saints player to a metal show, <laughs> uh, who would it be? And would you would, like, would you be in the pit? Would you be kind of around the edge or would you be kind of in the seats with them? Or would you, would you, would you change your approach based on who you took? <laughs> so I'm, I'm always in the standing section, not always in the pit. I used to always be in the pit, but, um, and now I'll go to most gigs with my girlfriend, so I don't tend to just sort of leave her to one side and then get bloodied up to return to her anymore. So yeah, um, so yeah, I still love it, and every now and then I get involved, but not so much. But again, like if I wanted to go in the pit, I'll probably just bring Fraser. Yeah, because uh, either he's going to scare everyone off because he's so so bloody big, or he's going to be a target in the pit, uh-huh. which obviously gives me an easier time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Although it might be an issue because he is six foot six, the crowd might get quite annoyed because he's so tall. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they might not be able to see the stage, and he's wide as he is tall as well. So yeah, I haven't factored that in. But if I'm thinking purely pit, yeah, I'll, I'll get Fraser in with me. That sounds good. That sounds good. Well, thanks for being <laughs> willing to answer those. I I, I figured uh, it was a good chance to be able to ask some questions that weren't related to the club, and I, I like to do that. And <laughs> and. Uh, you know, let, let's face it, we, we could all use a little bit of a laugh and a distraction. And I think maybe this, uh, for that reason, for us, maybe the international break comes at a good time where we can kind of just relax and watch some some truly meaningless uh, qualifiers for the most part. <laughs> most countries have either qualified or not. A uh, few have play-ins, but uh, I think, you know, hopefully just enjoy yeah. this, 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 this two weeks and, and come back and be ready, hopefully, for Liverpool. Yeah. And also, because most of our players have been so poor, a fair few of them aren't actually playing for their countries, which right. hopefully gives them a bit of a break and uh, will be refreshed for Liverpool. Um, yeah. As always, it remains to be seen. Sure, sure. Well, um, thank you, Jake, for for coming on. I, I do I do appreciate it, and uh, I'm, I'm always up to do this again if you're interested. Definitely. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, hopefully next time I'm on, it won't be coming off a loss, and uh, I'll have something positive to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. To anyone listening, I do apologize. I don't mean to be negative, but uh, I I do find it hard at at this very moment to find any positives coming from the Saints squad, uh, any player, um, and from any performance. So um, ordinarily, I'm not not overly negative. Trust me. No, no, I, I... And of course, maybe it's just me saying this because we're we're talking now. But like, I don't think we've been overly harsh or critical, and and we'll find out if we were. But I think I think we're kind of just <laughs> yeah. calling it like we see it. And I think, based on you know the poll you ran and, and the poll I ran, um, you know, I asked where are Saints going wrong, and I said is a boardroom manager players or torch at all, and forty one percent of the people said torch at all. So, um, <laughs> you know, I don't think but we're the only was, ones who are, who are feeling this way. That was an interesting part of your poll, which um, I forgot to mention is I believe. Uh, only 11% um, of the vote went went towards players. Yeah. And obviously Torture all incorporates players as well. Sure. But I do find it interesting that um, even now I feel the attitude is more, I, I guess, perhaps because our, our teams have been maybe even overperforming up until Quell season. Um, maybe they did overperform in Quell season, finishing eighth. Mm-hmm. Um, but even now it's still 
seems to be the case that um, the issues aren't viewed towards the squad we have. It's um, everything around it. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, like you said, wait and see, and, and hopefully, hopefully yeah. we're all wrong. Hopefully, we're all cheering. Yeah, I seriously hope I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I want to make that clear. I and and any players I ever criticise, I, I want to be proven wrong because I want the best for my team always. Even when I have someone writing about wanting Leicester to beat us, um, <laughs> I always want the best for our team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, well, thanks a lot, man, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Matt. And once again, that was my conversation with Jake Hughes. I'd like to thank Jake for coming on. You can get him on Twitter at JJ Hughes underscore, and you can follow St. Mary's Musings at St. Mary's Musings. The link to their Twitter profiles and the website are in the show notes below, so be sure to check them out and give them a follow. They have lots and lots of articles and, and, and Saints news and things coming out, so be sure to do that. And as we as we said uh, before the show and, and, and even during the interview, Coming back from this international break, we have to go to Anfield. Uh, that is going to be a tough match, going to be a big match. And it's going to be interesting to see how the team line up and how they play. Uh, this is, this, this begins kind of the real kind of test for us as a club. If given the teams that we played the first 11 matches, uh, the number of points that we've taken, now we're going into a run of fixtures where things are going to get much more difficult and we're going to still need to pick up points because we can't afford to drop points in each of these games or drop all of the points in each of these games uh, without really risking being in the relegation zone or in and around the relegation zone um, come come Christmas. So uh, hopefully that is is not the case, but it, it remains to be seen. And, and we will, we will see. Um, and I think that pretty much does it for the, the Saints FC portion of, of the show. But before we end this episode of the podcast, I'd like to give a shout out to Jay Hamination, who left a four star review on iTunes. Four stars, not five, obviously, but, uh, I'd rather people be honest than, um, just pat me on the back. But it still feels good to get, to get a review. So here it is. Uh, Jay Hamination says, good Southampton podcast. As a Saints fan living in the USA, I don't get a chance to connect with the community of Saints supporters. And this podcast is really great at giving you a feel for the community and what other fans are saying. And so I do appreciate that. It makes me feel like I'm doing a, a good job and lets me know that people appreciate it. You too can also leave a review on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcast and it helps other people find out about the show. Uh, another good way to do that is just to tweet the link at somebody, uh, tag somebody, uh, take their phone and, and actually download the show for them and say, here, here listen. Uh, that helps. Uh, any, any way that you can spread the podcast, it helps one more person find out about it. And hopefully that turns into one more person who listens on a regular basis and provides me feedback feedback and we can continue to make the show better, which is ultimately uh, my goal. So uh, hopefully you will do that. And you can find this show on iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, or wherever else you get your podcast. And you can subscribe at any of those places, including YouTube and SoundCloud. And you can also find us on Twitter at SFCDELL underscore IVERY or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash SFC delivery. There is no underscore in the Facebook address. Uh, follow us along on either of those. Uh, drop us some feedback there. Leave a review on iTunes or somewhere else. Uh, that always, always helps. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody who has done that, who has either liked the page or shared the, the, shared the show or written a review. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. And I think with all that being said, I think that's that's enough. Um for this show. I hope that you enjoy your international break. We will be back next week with an episode. Uh, it will be related to saints, uh, but not directly talking about the team. And, uh, I think you'll enjoy it and I look forward to, to talking to you then. But, um, until next time, remember that together we march on. <laughs>